You know, the first song that we sung today was Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and I just want to give you a little background on that song. The song was written in 1737 by Charles Wesley, and Charles' brother, uh, John Wesley, you may have heard of him more, he was a preacher and was uh, the founder of the Methodist Church. But Charles was known more for writing hymns. He wrote over 6,000 hymns in his lifetime. Now, the melody that we sing Hark the Herald Angels to didn't come along until over 100 years later when a man named Felix Mendelssohn wrote that tune but didn't write it for Hark the Herald Angels Sing. A singer, an opera singer, William Cummings, a few years later combined the words of Hark the Herald Angels Sing with the tune that Felix uh, Mendelssohn wrote, and we have today what we understand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, for some of you, when I told you that, you went, hmm. Others are going, why are you telling us that? Well, here's why. October and November, we spend all of our time preaching, teaching about being a faith at home church, passing on that faith to our next generation and, and the next generation and the next, and we just want to be that church that does that. And, and on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, we spent most of our time talking about family and, and accomplishing that very thing. But Christmas has come. And we just want to pause for a few weeks here and just, and just focus on that wonderful celebration of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. And I want to do that by taking some very common and well-known uh, well and loved uh, Christmas carols or Christmas songs that we sing and just taking the message out of those songs because ultimately the songs, uh, the messages from the songs came from the Bible. And I want to begin with Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this song basically is just saying, hey, I've got something to tell you, something big. It's about an announcement and how something is announced how something is announced, how it is told, is very important. I read the story, I've heard the story this week of a gentleman who went off, uh, he was going to travel and be gone in another part of the world for several months, so he left his brother in charge of everything back home. Uh, and one of the things he left his brother in charge of was he left him with his cat. And it's, he loved his cat, and he left him with that uh, to watch after you know, after a couple of, uh, I've been gone a month or so, he called back and he said, how are things going? They're going good. He said, well, how's my cat? He said, well, your cat died. He said, whoa, you, you can't tell somebody something they love like that. You just can't just throw it on them like that. He says, you got to build into it. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, this is kind of, this is how you do it. Well, if I would have called and said, how's my cat? You would say, well, the cat got out on the roof, is out on the roof, and we can't get him to come inside, but we've called the fire department, and they're going to come get him down. Call me back tomorrow, I'll let you know how it went. Okay, and I would call you back the next day. So, what, well, the fire department got the cat down, but all the commotion, he ran out in the street and got hit by a car. But don't worry, he's at the vet, the vet thinks everything's going to be all right. Call me back tomorrow, I'll let you know how it's going. Calls back the next day, he said, well, how's, how's my cat? And he said, well, cat took a turn for the worse, but they're not giving up on the cat. Maybe they, they can save him. Call me back tomorrow. They call back the next day, and then you would say, they tried everything they could, but they couldn't save your cat. He said, that would give me three or four days to be ready for that news. He said, okay. He said, oh, well, that's in the past. He said, how's Grandma doing? And the guy thought a second. He says, well, Grandma got out on the roof. How we make an announcement is important. How we do it. And in this song here, it's important that we look. How the birth of Jesus was announced. And when you look at that first chorus, you see some of the great message of the announcement that Jesus is born. But we know where the inspiration or where this story comes from. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. And that's just where this great story of the birth of Christ is told. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. 
Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. On the night that Jesus was born, the most significant moment in history up to that point, the most significant moment in history, an angel appears to lowly shepherds in a field. Now, we have this very, very uh, beautiful view of shepherds in a field, and we just think it's a beautiful picture, but in that day, shepherds were about as a low on-the-job ring as you can, you can get. They were not looked up to. You didn't look to be a shepherd. That was just something that was passed down, and that's what you became. So it was the most spectacular night for shepherds. But for the angel, you wonder if it did not come across as anticlimactic. You know, why, with this such an announcement, are we wasting it on a couple of shepherds in a field? I'm afraid that, and I'm sure I would have, wanted to make the biggest announcement I could that my son was being born, that was going to save the world, and everyone would have heard about it that very night. But I'm reminded once again that God's ways are not our ways. There in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. We know there was one angel speaking, but it's how many angels are there now. You know, it doesn't say, but in other places in the Bible, when it talks about the angels that Jesus had at his beck and call, it mentions 10,000 angels. So it's possible that 10,000 angels filled the sky that night and were, were making this announcement. We're sure of this, no matter how many there were, we can be pretty sure that more made the announcement than heard the announcement. Possibly 10,000 to 10. I think sometimes we get wound up and caught up in the wrong things, and it's so easy to do at Christmas. And what a nice reminder, what a great reminder that Jesus just spoke a simple message. The angel spoke a simple message. A Savior is born. Jesus was born in a stable while three miles away stood a palace that Herod the Great had constructed, a fortress, a palace for himself called Herodium. On a man-made hill, a man-made hill that rose 2,400 feet into the sky, almost a half a mile high, he built this palace. And literally, in sight of the palace built this way, the king of kings was born in a stable who appeared to be unkingly with the king of kings and would change the world. You know, this song, Hark the Arrow the Angels Sing, reminds us to join the triumph of the skies with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. The shepherds did that. They were a small group, but they went, and then they spread the word. And we're a small group compared to the world, but our job is the same thing, spread that. To spread that great news, not just at Christmas, that a Savior is born. The second verse there, it really emphasizes who Jesus is, who Jesus is. And we're going to look at some of the things in that verse but, you know, it's important, it's imperative that we know who Jesus is. And we live in a time where everything, so much is built upon feelings and so little is built upon facts in our world that that filters right over or flows right over into the church as well, how we feel about something, not what we know about something, what the facts are. And it is important to know what we believe. 1 Peter 3.15 reminds us of that very thing. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. And he says, always, always know what you believe. 
to give the reason for the hope that you have. Then he goes on and says, but do this with gentleness and respect. A wife was standing in front of the mirror in the bedroom there, like all of us have done it sometime now, just stand in the mirror and look at each other and look at ourselves in the mirror and we turn to the side and look and she was looking there and she was, her husband walked in and she just kind of went, <sighs> he says, what's wrong? She said, I'm just looking and I'm old, my hair is gray, I've got all these wrinkles, I'm fat, I just so feel so bad about it. So I need you to pay me a compliment. <laughs> and he thought for just a second, he said, well, best thing to tell you, eyesight's pretty close to perfect. <laughs> you know. And just so you know, that's when the fight started. <laughs> so, but that's not being ready to either give an answer or to give it in gentleness and respect. But it's important for us to do those very things, to know and to be ready to give an answer. Packed into this verse are some of the great truths of Jesus. And I just want to quickly look at just a few of these here. In this verse, we see his deity. We see that he, he was divine. He was God. Jesus was God. We're reminded in John 1, uh, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God. We're also reminded of his incarnation, and that just simply means that him coming to earth uh, in human form. You see, sometimes it's so easy for us to think the stable, the Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus is the beginning of Jesus. It isn't. Just like we just said, Jesus was in the beginning, but the stable, the Bethlehem, the birth, is, is him coming to this earth. His coming in bodily form. You know, John 1, 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Eugene Peterson, <clears throat> in the message paraphrase, says, The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus is not to be compared to Muhammad, to Buddha, to anyone else because they are people who are fully human they're people who uh, beginning and end is here jesus is the only one who came as god in man we see that it, it speaks of his virgin birth you know the prophet isaiah isaiah prophesied that in isaiah seven fourteen, he says the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him emmanuel and this is important. We don't need to just gloss over this and forget it. He was born of a virgin. Although Jesus was born as any other human being is born, he was born of a woman like every other human is, he was not conceived as every other human was. He was conceived by God himself. When the angel told Mary that she was uh, pregnant and she would have give birth to Jesus, this is what she said back. Uh, or this is, what, uh, this is what Mary said back in Luke 1, 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This song brings out the message that he was born as a man conceived of God we also see his humanity he didn't just come here he became he became as a man he he subjected himself to the very things we're subjected to I read this week uh, that the Saudi prince uh, uh, Fadal Assad and you don't know how to pronounce it either uh, <laughs> rented Disneyland Paris in May of 2013 for three days to celebrate his own graduation. After the three days, the bill was $19.5 million. So this coming May, remember to remember your graduate. When the <laughs> but Jesus didn't come to be that pampered monarch or that 
prince or the, the king's son and everything be handed to him. He lived as a human. He worked. He suffered pain. He disappointment. He, he felt the, the, the feelings of loss and grief. He subjected himself to, to those things. He even faced the same temptations that we face, but he didn't sin. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. What a connection that Jesus makes between mankind and him. In the song, So Much God, some of the lyrics read this way. He was so much man that he slept in a boat. Yet he was so much God that the wind ceased when he spoke. He was so much man that he wept when Lazarus died. Yet he was so much God, Lazarus came forth when he cried. He was so much man that he thirsted at the well. Yet he was so much God that he saved her soul from hell. He was so much man that he died upon a tree. He was so much God that he rose in victory. Never, ever forget that Jesus, who he is, who he was when he came, who he is now, and that he identifies with us in all the things he did, his humanity, his, uh, all the things that he brought to this earth. Now, the third verse talks about and this leads right into that, what Jesus does for us. What Jesus does for us. You know, when we look at that, that last verse and we sang it this morning, we realize that one of the things that he did was that Jesus brings light and life. John 8, 12 says, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, culture... The elites of our world, it's always been this way. Hollywood portrays followers of Christ as unintelligent, uninformed, just following old traditions and old wives' tales. And if you're truly intelligent, truly enlightened, you will see right through all of those things and not follow Christ. But what makes a person intelligent? What makes them enlightened? I mean, you can, you can have the greatest fashion, style sense, and dress perfectly. But if you don't know how to treat and respect your husband, are you intelligent? You can know how to make a living, make a million dollars, be second to none. But if you don't know how to communicate with your sons and daughters, are you truly intelligent? Intelligent, intelligent person is one who has knowledge about the vital issues of life. A wise person is one who can practically apply that knowledge to everyday life. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus reminds us, he says, what good, it, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? The things that brings us, the things that Jesus brings us, how he teaches us to live, and puts priorities on is like light introduced into darkness. Another thing that he does that we see in this song is he brings victory over death. When Lazarus died, Jesus said this to Martha, his sister, in John 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. There's a saying, if you are born once, you will die twice. If you are born twice, you will die once. And what that means is natural born people that we all are will experience physical death. But if we are born spiritually, we will never experience spiritual death. Jesus being born uh, on the night that he was born signaled that his perfect life, his perfect birth, his perfect life, followed by a perfect sacrificial death, followed by a perfect re uh, resurrection, paved the way for all who will call on his name 
accept his sacrifice, submit to him, would live forever. I told you that song was packed full of so much meaning, so much message for us to reflect on. But there's one more thing about this song I want to tell you. When Charles Wesley first wrote this song in 1737, the word angels didn't even appear in it. The line said, Hark how all the welkin rings. And if you know what welkin is, I need to talk to you. You need to get out a little more. (laughs) But welkin was an old English word that just simply meant the vault of heaven. In other words, he was saying it just poured out of heaven. Hark how the welkin rings. But an old classmate of Charles Wesley, George Whitefield, took those words and rewrote them just a little bit and put, Hark the herald angels sing. And he did this without asking Wesley's permission. And this phrasing became a lot more popular in the churches. Wesley was incensed terribly mad about this not only did he was he mad that whitefield had had taken it without his permission he felt like it was biblically incorrect to say that the angels sang because the bible says that they praise god saying and so he was upset and as long as he lived charles wesley never would sing the song as charles as george whitefield had changed the words and the way it had actually caught on in the churches so the man who wrote the words god and sinner reconciled was at odds with his brother and i tell you that little bit for this reason all the things that we talked about is the great message of this song great message but just how easy it is to kind of get off track isn't it to focus on things that distract us you know maybe your life here at this christmas falls into several categories i mean maybe it's perfect it's going to be a perfect christmas maybe not maybe there's some things you're really struggling with at this time maybe there's some things that really need attention you're at odds with someone else you're at odds with god let this be a reminder that at christmas is no better time than to make things right But also know, also know that we have a God, all the message of this this one song, we have a God who is in the business of making things right, that he brings God and sinner back together, that he brings brother and brother back together. So I hope this year as we sing some of our Christmas songs that we love, I hope we'll look at the meaning as well and look at the message. Apply it to where we're at in our life. Be thankful for the message, what Jesus has done, what he is doing. 